Okay, so we left off looking at the types of evidence that we rely on to dry, draw conclusions about the Earth's climate in past historical periods. In this section, we're going to take a look at why the Quaternary has oscillated between glacial and interglacial periods. But first, let's talk briefly about what Earth's climate was like during glacial periods. We're in an interglacial period right now, but what were the glacial periods like? Evidence suggests that average global temperatures during these periods were about 6 degrees Celsius or 13 degrees Fahrenheit colder than they are today, which may not seem like a super dramatic difference, but it is sufficient to cause major changes on the surface of the planet. During these periods, large ice sheets covered much of North America, Asia, and Europe. The climate was also drier, which, remember, can be deduced from the dust content in the ice core layers. And as a result of the remaining land mass on Earth that wasn't covered in ice, there was more grassland and desert and less temperate forest and tropical rainforest compared to today. And because so much more water was tied up in the form of ice sheets, there was less water in the oceans and sea levels were lower. So sea level varies at each glacial period, but during the most recent extreme glacial period, which was 20,000 years ago and is referred to as the last glacial maximum or the LGM, sea levels were about 120 meters lower than they are today, which is about 360 feet. Consequently, more land was exposed because there was less water. So there were land bridges connecting the northeastern part of the Asian continent and the northwestern part of North America, um, land bridge connecting England to continental Europe, connecting Australia to Papua New Guinea, and connecting various island nations in Southeast Asia with the main land mass of Asia. And you can see in this depiction how much of the world was also covered in ice sheets and sea ice. The gray areas represent sea ice, um, which you can see reached all the way up to the South American continent in the Southern Hemisphere. And you can see that sheet ice covered much of North America, virtually all of Canada, and much of the U.S. was um, basically one big glacier. And now again, this is obviously not reflective of the world we live in today, because we are in an interglacial period. But the Earth has oscillated back and forth between looking more like this and looking more like the conditions that we have today many times over the past 2.6 million years. So what causes these regular recurring oscillations? Why do we have these glacial cycles? Well, as we said in the past section, there are multiple factors, but scientists believe that the triggers for the cycle to run are a combination of different characteristics of how the Earth moves through space. So specifically, there are three characteristics pertaining to the Earth's movement through space that shift over time at regular intervals. And together, these changes are called Milankovitch cycles. And these regularly scheduled changes to the Earth's movement through space trigger small changes on the surface of the Earth, which then cascade into runaway positive feedback loops that create more significant changes. So the first of these three characteristics that play in the, into the Milankovitch cycles is the Earth's eccentricity, or in other words, how the shape of the orbit um, of the Earth plays out when it's moving around the sun. Earth's orbit changes shape very slowly over time. Um, it gradually cycles between being circular in shape to being elliptical or oval shaped. And this cycle occurs in two separate ways. One form of the cycle takes place every 100,000 years and another takes place every 400,000 years. And this is significant for the Earth's climate because during these elliptical periods, the Earth may be significantly closer to the sun during certain seasons as compared to other seasons. The Earth's orbit is currently in an elliptical stage, and it's elliptical in such a way that we are closest to the sun in early January and furthest from the sun in early July, which makes for slightly milder summers and winters. The second characteristic of Earth's planetary movement that plays into the Milankovitch cycles is obliquity also known as axial tilt. So just like Earth's orbit shape changes over time, the degree of the tilt in Earth's axis also shifts over time. It cycles between 22.1 degrees of tilt and 24.5 degrees of tilt and back every 41,000 years. And this is significant for Earth's climate because the more dramatic the angle of the tilt, 
the larger the difference is between the temperatures that are seen in the winter versus during the summer. At the present time, the Earth's axis tilt is at 23.5 degrees, and it's moving in the decreasing direction toward 22.1 degrees. The third and final characteristic is axial precession, which describes the direction in which the Earth's axis points. The direction that the axis points also changes over time. It cycles between pointing at the star Polaris, which is also known as the North Star, and a star called Vega every 26,000 years. And this directionality determines at what point during the year the seasons occur on Earth. Currently, the axis is pointing at Polaris, the North Star, and this means that the peak of the summer occurs in July and the peak of the winter happens in January. But if the axis were pointing toward Vega, this would be reversed. So overall, there are these three different characteristics of the Earth's movement that cycle through different stages on a regular basis. Precession, the direction the axis is pointing, um, completes a cycle every 26,000 years. Obliquity, the angle of the axis, completes a cycle every 41,000 years. And eccentricity, the shape of the orbit, completes a cycle every 100,000 or 400,000 years. So naturally, at certain points, the different aspects of these Milankovitch cycles are going to coincide with each other and interact, and they can amplify the overall effect on the climate and cause major changes that drive the glacial and interglacial cycling. So let's take a look at how this works by examining the example of the last glacial maximum period. Heading into the last glacial maximum period, Earth's orbit was more elliptical, and it was elliptical in such a way that the Earth was farther away from the Sun during the Northern Hemisphere summer. This, of course, led to lower insulation for the Northern Hemisphere. In addition, during this period, the axial tilt was more straight up and down rather than angled, and this also resulted in lower insulation for the Northern Hemisphere during the summer because that hemisphere wasn't leaning toward the Sun as strongly. These combined effects led the Northern Hemisphere to experience very mild summers, wherein the ice and snow from the wintertime did not fully melt during the summer, and so glaciers advanced and ice sheets grew over time, which increased the albedo of the planet, led to more solar energy being reflected, and caused the climate to cool even further, which led to more ice sheet formation, higher albedo, and so on, and so a runaway positive feedback loop was triggered that sent the Earth spiraling into an ice age. So now we have a sense of how glacial periods can start, but how do, the, how do these periods end? How do they transition into the interglacial periods? Well, this whole time, the orbital characteristics of the Earth continue to change. And eventually the Earth's orbit becomes more circular and less elliptical, which increases the level of insulation during the summer, and also the tilt of the Earth's axis takes on a more dramatic angle, which also increases summer in insulation. And the combination of these two things causes the climate to warm, which leads to the melting of ice, which decreases albedo, which further warms the climate, and so on. And so another runaway feedback loop is triggered until the Milankovitch cycle starts moving in the opposite direction. So this is ultimately how these glacial and interglacial cycles have gone back and forth over the course of the Quaternary period. We also know that greenhouse gases play a role in these processes too. Proxy data shows that changes in carbon dioxide correlate strongly with changes in the Earth's climate corresponding to these glacial and interglacial periods. We saw this in the previous section. Carbon dioxide levels are higher during interglacial periods, and carbon dioxide levels are lower during glacial periods which makes sense because we know that carbon dioxide is a major greenhouse gas. What we don't yet know is what it is about the Milankovitch cycles that causes carbon dioxide levels to increase and then decrease as the Earth's orbital characteristics are changing. Possible explanations that are being investigated include the fact that as glacial ice and permafrost melts, then organic matter that is trapped in the ice and the permafrost starts to get decomposed, which releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Or perhaps that the changing temperatures cause differences in the abilities of oceans and ecosystems to absorb carbon dioxide. 
What we do know is that levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today are at their highest levels ever recorded in the Quaternary period. This graph here shows only the past 800,000 years of the Quaternary. And as you can see, um, carbon dioxide levels have increased and decreased with glacial and interglacial cycles over the past 800,000 years. There's an ebb and flow. But if you took a, take a look at the far right-hand side of the graph, levels of CO2 in the atmosphere today are substantially higher than any other point on the graph. And this is because uh, human activity, namely the burning of fossil fuels, is dumping huge volumes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So a major question for climate scientists is whether these CO2 levels are going to reach a point where they trigger a runaway positive feedback loop of heating, where the greenhouse effect becomes so enhanced that polar ice caps melt, albedo decreases, um, higher temperatures are brought on, more melting, widespread sea level rise and desertification of ecosystems, all because the Earth system reaches this tipping point where CO2 levels trigger a runaway of these processes that could lead to dramatic and frankly devastating changes to the Earth as we know it. Um, this is what we're gonna be talking about in our next section. Instead of looking back at the quaternary in our next section, we'll be looking at the present and the way that the climate is changing right now.